So Razi, you'll kick us off, right? Yeah, we're uh, we're now live, I think. So thanks everybody for joining us uh, for tonight's event, which is I think number four in our informal, not actually a series of events called um, informally titled "Yes, We're Going There." And this one is uh, was Ayn Rand wrong about homosexuality? And uh, we have two, I think probably our two most popular objectivist guests in terms of uh, viewership on, on YouTube, right? Dr. Harry Binswanger and James Valiant. And we have chairing the discussion, uh, one of our four most popular co-hosts of the Daily Objective, Nikos Sotirakopoulos. So Nikos, uh, go ahead, kick us off. Hi, thanks everyone. Thanks Razi, thanks to our guest. So last week we started uh, with the uh, the issue of Ayn Rand's controversial views on Native Americans. So these are some of the topics that usually people will point the finger and says, look, objectivism is not a good philosophy because Ayn Rand was not a good person because of her view on that topic. And of course, because there's no topic that we are not uh, uh, eager to discuss, we had James last week to discuss this topic of, on Native Americans. Today, we have the issue of Ayn Rand's view on homosexuality, which in some ways, it's an even more difficult topic because her comments on the topic are even shorter than the comments she had on the issue of Native Americans and property rights. But uh, as we do, we have with us people who understand objectivism way better than we do, but also people who have been around the objective movement and Ayn Rand herself, so they can shed light to that. So we have James Valiant. Hi, James. James is the author of The Creation of Christ, and he has been with us also in previous events. But also we have back to the Ayn Rand Center UK, Harry Binswager. Harry has been an author. He has written the book, How We Know, which is one of the ultimate guides in epistemology from an objective point of view. Also, he's running the Harry Binswager letter, hbletter.com, where he provides a commentary from, again, from an objective point of view and also running events. So I don't think our speakers today need a lot of introduction. So let's start very quickly. So Razi has put on the Zoom comments uh, the Harry Binswager letter link. So James, where does this controversy come from? So give us also a bit of context. What has Ayn Rand or people in her, uh, in her orbit? So for example, Nathaniel Brandon back in the day, what have they said about the issue of homosexuality and why has this created a controversy? Well, yes, uh, you know, uh, the entire issue is a super controversial one. And to just set it a little bit into its proper historical context, I don't have a lot of respect for uh, the DSM, the Standard Psychiatric Diagnostic Manual. But even the DSM only with uh, divisions and argument changed their opinion uh, on uh, whether or not homosexuality was a psychological uh, uh, illness or not in the 1970s. Uh, Ayn Rand's comments on the subject are in Q&A sessions. And as you pointed out, very brief. And I think it's very unfair to judge someone. You know, normally Ayn Rand, when she discussed a subject, she would go through it completely and thoroughly. She would talk about it, the basic uh, philosophy behind it, all the relevant concepts, she'd have concretes, and she'd be able to explain it in a, you know, a full and complete way. Here we have a couple of answers in Q&A sessions, which are extremely brief, and at one level could almost be understood to be an assertion of her own personal tastes <laughs> and values. But she did go further, apparently. On the face of it, it appears that even in those brief comments, which may be uh, so brief that they're hard to judge, uh, she does appear to be making both a psychological uh, and a moral assertion about its practice. I will assume that when Ayn Rand uh, was speaking, she's talking about the practice, not the emotion because she was very clear in more than one place, including her, her brilliant essay, The Psychology of Psychologizing, that emotions as such are not subject to moral evaluation. You can't say John is a bad person for having emotion X, but 
there are cases in which uh, acting on those emotions, if you, especially in this age of psychology, if you if something about your psychology is making you unhappy or dysfunctional, it is your responsibility to address psychological issues. There's a moral component to addressing your own psychology. Uh, for example, if, a, if it was a rapist who had an emotional urge to rape someone, you wouldn't just say, uh, go ahead and act on that, on that desire. It's the acting on the desire that we can morally judge, even assuming that there's a psychological issue uh, present. But to frame the issue, Ayn Rand does seem to say in those brief answers that it is both, the practice of it is both immoral and she believed based on psychological corruptions. Obviously, there have been, now you asked about the movement wider, there have been many homosexuals who've been attracted to objectivism. And I think there are reasons for that. I think that, you know, to reject your uh, family or to have your family reject you or to have to go against your religious beliefs. Uh, and in a society, I think the 21st century is a lot more tolerant than the 20th century was on the subject. Uh, and so it took, I think, especially back in Iran's lifetime, sort of a spine of steel uh, sort of uh, independence and courage and a willingness to stand up for yourself and who you are as an individual. And so I think there are a lot of uh, homosexuals that have been attracted to Ayn Rand's uh, individualism. Uh, and I don't think it's an accident that they are. I also don't think that it was a fortunate result that Ayn Rand's comments hurt those people. Uh, obviously hurting feelings shouldn't be the standard of what, whether we say the truth or not, but in effect, without giving a more elaborate answer, the more detailed answer, I think her comments did hurt people in her audience uh, who regard her, properly regarded her as an authority and created a lot of self-doubt. I think that's unfortunate too. But just in terms of framing the issue, I think that's where we are. Thank you. Harry, uh, some first comments. Uh, I, th I think, um... James stated it pretty well, except the reason why I'm here is that I asked her about it privately in her apartment one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, it's important that people know what she said, because in the question period when you're on stage, particularly facing um, antagonistic questions, it's easy to say something that is not exactly what you meant to say. I've done it myself. I think everyone has done it. Uh, and I asked her directly as a, um, you know, uh, focused question, do you think that homosexuality is a result of immorality? And to my somewhat surprise, she said, I'm not prepared to say that. There's so much complexity to psychology and the development of sexual identity. I don't think she used the words sexual identity, but that was what she was communicating. The way you are sexually in your psychology, there's so much complexity and conflict and mixtures and twists and turns that I couldn't say that it inherently involves immorality. Now, that was the end of that discussion, but um, it puts a quite a different light on what her actual position was. And I do know a couple of things um, about her attitude towards uh, pretty open homosexuality in her company. And uh, I don't know it from observing how she behaved, but being told uh, and, and inferring both. When she lived in the San Fernando Valley, her next door neighbors were Adrian, I don't know his last name, the, the designer, sure. costume designer who for the movies, who was known as Adrian, costumes by Adrian, who's a talented and sought after costume designer and maybe set designer. And he lived next door to them in um, Chatsworth in the San Fernando Valley. And he was known to be homosexual. Uh, and he had a what they called a purple marriage to Janet Gaynor, the actress. A purple marriage was a marriage between a homosexual and 
may be a female homosexual or a, a non-homosexual for the purposes of keeping up appearances. And I'm pretty sure she had to know. I don't think he kept it that hidden from inside, you know, Hollywood people that he was gay and she uh, was friendly with him and always spoke kindly of him and warmly of him. And the other was that Leonard Peikoff told me um, about her and John Hospers. Now, John Hospers was uh, a very, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but he was very homosexual. And uh, Dr. Peikoff said that there was a road trip in the car in which Hospers was in the back seat with his boyfriend. And I guess Dr. Peikoff was in the present, was in the front seat maybe Ayn Rand was. And they were uh, visibly uh, touching each other, you know, being uh, physically affectionate. I assume nothing grotesque, uh, but uh, there was some obvious display of homosexual feeling between Hospers and his then boyfriend. And she had, you know, not, nothing to say about it. She was, you know, fine with it. Uh, I, I mean, I shouldn't say that, but she she was not glowering, apparently. She just had no no response. And the other thing which fits in with both those, actually, is that we once discussed our own reactions to homosexuality. And she said, I think everyone finds homosexuality of the opposite sex much less disgusting or or you know, uh, I forget what words to use, uh, uh, upsetting, you know, then of the same sex. And I certainly feel that way. And I think most everybody does. Uh, so even in terms of, um, you know, what you would glower at, lesbianism, she probably would have glowered at a lot more than male homosexuality. <laughs> so... She did regard it, and I regard it, as a psychological problem. But there are lots of psychological problems, and uh, many good people have psychological problems. So uh, that is an entirely different thing. And she regarded it as repulsive to witness, particularly of her own sex, and I do too. Uh, okay, so wait a minute. Why, why though... Uh... Can you link, but James told us that this view, that it has something to do with a psychological thing that you can control or that it is a disease, is, has been completely been eradicated from psychology for the last 40 years, isn't that so, yeah. 50 years? Yeah, pretty much. Um, and uh, I know it doesn't, it, see, it said, there's another thing I want to say, which is so, two more things, which are philosophical. But should I stop here? And, and um, before we shift to the issue of can you control it, for instance, I just right, want yeah, the main let's, thing let's... I wanted to say is that her considered opinion was that it was not necessarily inherently immoral to, to, be, to be a homosexual. And I assume right. to act on it because, as Leonard Peikoff said, you know, if you're that way and you you can't see any way to change it, maybe you can't change it. Why should you deprive yourself of the pleasure? Right. I so, mean, the value of romantic love is a universal one for human beings. And uh, but what I want to ask more about is by what standard do you assess it to be a psychological problem? Uh, if it doesn't appear to otherwise uh, affect functioning, uh, if it doesn't otherwise make someone unhappy, or if that unhappiness is simply the result of some social, you know, uh, context, yeah. by, by what standard do we judge it as uh, even a psychological illness or a problem? Um, well, I'm not a psychologist, particularly not of um, that kind of thing, sexual psychology. Uh, there was, Brandon did have a theory of it, and I think they probably both agreed at that time. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't have a, uh, to me, it just seems clear that in ways I can't 
give a definitive explanation of that the homosexual males, my understand a little better, I think, have a problem with a standard of masculinity that they feel they can't live up to and don't want to live up to. And in many cases, it's a false standard, but they, but they hold it. So that's why I think there are a lot of male homosexuals in object, I, I don't know a lot, but not trivial number of male homosexual, homosexuals in objectivism because objectivism holds that there's strength other than brute strength. Um, oh, also I'm going partly by a, a, a homosexual I knew in high school and his attitudes and values, but that's, that's not a good, um, that's a lead, but that's not a theory. Uh, so I don't want to talk too much about that because that is really psychology. It's not part of objectivism. And that's right. Maybe right. I should say that the other point, uh, the objectivist philosophy is not the same as the views of Ayn Rand. And um, suppose she was wrong on dogs versus cats, where she like thought cats are better pets than dogs, but a little ridiculous, you know, that, that wouldn't be an issue of objectivism. And the way that uh, this was begun, where people say, well, Ayn Rand's a bad person, therefore the, I don't like this philosophy. Um, is an ad hominem. It has nothing to do with the, the rational validity of her ideas, what she thought of uh, a psychological issue, right. or even what she thought of non psychological. It's what she wrote and said. Uh, but I don't want to give the impression that I think, well, she was kind of strange, but her ideas are right. No, I, I agree 100%. I don't think it's anything with Ayn Rand being wrong. I think the culture is wrong. Right. So okay, I have to put me on to that side. Some, let me do, let me push back a bit because there's some things that I don't understand. So first of all, even whether it is a choice or it's not a choice, why in any of these case would someone's sexual orientation be immoral? So that's the first question. So even if I understand that by the time of the, the, the standard of, psych, of the science at that time says that it is a disorder, which today we know it is not. But even if this was the case, why would it be that someone would still today consider it immoral? That's the first question. And the other question is, I want you, both of your comments on Brandon's take on, on, uh, on the virtue of selfishness, which he says that in a way that homosexuality has to do with the way that people are taught that sex is bad and that women are to be worshipped in a platonic way. Because this looks like, sounds to me a bit like what you said, uh, Harry, that the problem is with the culture. So, but this creates more questions in my mind than answers. So let me push a bit more on this. So why, why would it be that one's moral orientation be morally good or bad unless it creates a problem with them in terms of not being able to pursue their values? So let's say, even if your values is having children, uh, today you can do this via adoption or whatever. But even if this is not the case, why would this have anything to do with one's morality? I don't get that. I have to say that there's more, more to add to what you just said there. Ayn Rand was a explicit opponent of platonic love. That is to say, under the appropriate circumstances, you should act on that level. Obviously, your partner has to vo voluntarily reciprocate to some extent. But the point is that uh, if you have a serious feeling, you should act on it. You should express it. an unexpressed emotion. There's something wrong there, too. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that it is, I agree with Dr. Binswager, it's not objectivism, it's psychology. And I do think that uh, Nathaniel Brandon, even there was only presenting a possible cause. He wasn't saying all homosexuality is caused by, he says the homosexual who is, as if that is a, and he, as a therapist, I don't know if he'd run into such a character, but even he is not saying it's all, all of it. And just on the issue of, of psychology, it is my own view that we really don't know enough about the subject to make an a, you know, a clinical medical evaluation uh, at that level. 
uh, honestly, I just, the answer here scientifically in my mind is I don't know. I think it is, a it is not a question of choice and that's all we have to know to know that the emotion itself is outside the realm of moral evaluation. Um, the emotion as such is outside the realm of moral evaluation and John is bad for feeling it. And uh, since it's not a choice and since it's not easily at least changed, if, if maybe it's impossible to change at a certain point. Now, I don't believe it's genetic. I think the uh, identical twin studies show beyond a reasonable doubt that it's not a matter of simple uh, genetics. It probably has to do with early uh, cognitions, uh, you know, that we make early experiences, maybe attachment with our caregivers. You know, we come to conclude things about what men and women are long before you know, what boys and girls are long before we actually learn where babies come from. And by the time we learn where babies come from, we've already formulated all kinds of self evaluations and evaluations about our relationship to what's male and to what's female. So I do believe, I agree with Rand in the sense that it, what we're talking about is something, you know, psychological in early childhood. I myself, simply looking at the data, cannot say that it is a psychological problem. You know, can you get what humans get from romantic love in a healthy way uh, from a homosexual relationship. The empirical evidence I have suggests, yes, that uh, they can have long-term meaningful relationships, serious relationships with the kind of visibility that you see in heterosexual relationships. I obviously am not a psychic and I can't get into it. I myself know that I'm not usual. I'm not an ordinary person in my psychology, but I, what I don't want to do is impose my psychology on what I think is healthy or not. Um, and given the psychiatric consensus in Ayn Rand's time and given her own, you know, emotions that she's got a right. That's the other thing I would want to stress. If homosexuals have a right to their emotions, then so does Ayn Rand. She has an, whatever we say about it psychologically. Ayn Rand has a right to her own emotional yuck perspective. Yeah, but like we have a right to too. say that this is not uh, right or this is not uh, this doesn't seem to follow from the rest. So what I'm trying to do is trying to see how this fits with the rest of the philosophy, because to me, clearly, well, clearly it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not part of the philosophy, Nikos. And your, your question to answer directly is, you can't make a moral judgment. And uh, when she said to me, no, she couldn't do it, that was what she was trying to walk her answer back to at that Fort Hall Forum. She said, it's immoral. And then she said, at least psychologically. Well, there's no such category as psychological immorality. What she was I trying agree. to do is she realized, I think, to psychologize her, that, that she said something, although it expressed a vague truth, you know, that it's not right in some way. She shouldn't have said it was immoral. So she said at least psychologically. And then in a calmer moment off stage, and when I asked her a year or two later, maybe five years later, she said, wouldn't be prepared to say it's uh, immoral which um, is, her, is more her considered position. But basically, her considered position is what she said in writing. I've heard her say things, even in you know, direct answer to question, that she would contradict later. So she saw, she looked at reality. And you can look at reality and see one thing and not realize there's something else over here at that moment. And oh, yeah, that's true, too. So uh, one time she told me that, uh, for instance, that Rachmaninoff had too much struggle in it. It was she, the Rachmaninoff was not her favorite composer. And I said, actually, she didn't say that. I said, not her favorite composer. I said, too much struggle? And she said, yes. And another uh, time she said that Chopin was not her favorite composer. She, and she described Chopin as music for old ladies. <laughs> now, but we uh, know that she loved both of those. So at least yes. Certain pieces of both of those composers. Yes. And I think when she said music for old ladies, she was thinking of the, uh, what are the sad uh, things? I can't think of the genres and name for, for them. You know, like they're the Polonaises, the Mazurkas, and the Nocturnes. The Nocturnes are kind of drippy. And when she was talking about Rachmaninoff, there, uh, it was playing uh, the, in the background. There was playing. That's why I asked it. 
a piece that did have a lot of struggle in it. So it's not really a contradiction. But anyway, what a person says at the moment, responding to a fact that they see, is not the same as their official philosophy, unless, you know, they say it is. Uh, and and uh, she was very clear that objectivism does not include psychology. Uh, she thought Brandon was going to do that, and she thought it applied to psychology probably more than it actually does. But anyway, do that, do she thought that, that. Do you think that Mr. Brandon may have influenced her in a negative way about this? Probably because I'm reading an interview with uh, Leonard Peikoff and me that I've forgotten where uh, Dr. Peikoff explains what a malevolent pressure Brandon exerted on her, that he was always looking for the explanation that said people are no good and that this was not natural to her. Uh, but he had convincing arguments and they were false, but plausible arguments. So his influence, such as it was, was in that direction. So probably. And I have um, to say here, I want to add a very important point here, that Ayn Rand always believed, of course, that it should be legal. And Dr. Oh. Binswanger in particular, 40 years ago, wrote a scathing attack on the Supreme Court decision which upheld the Georgia sodomy law. So Dr. Binswanger and Ayn Rand and objectivism as such has always, always believed it should be legal. Oh, it's not yeah. a question of legal right. And I okay, just want to so commend Dr. Binswanger for being a pioneering brave, brave voice on that 40 years ago. Okay, so there is no claim then, because I think also some people, myself and some people in the chat, we got the idea that there is an argument to be made that homosexuality can be psychologically moral, which for me doesn't make sense. That's why I asked the follow-up. No, I don't think it makes sense. Yeah, a I psychology think she was trying to a... walk it back. Oh, yeah, okay. psychology so, is not I, immoral I nor that, immoral. Yeah, it sounded as you, Harry, said that you agree that it is immoral. No. No, oh, okay. I mean, it okay. may be in some cases, you know, if there's an extreme flaming guy who's faking reality in pretending something to himself. But even then, there are a lot of um, things that are wrong with people that are not moral issues, like someone who's repressed. And she said Reardon was repressed. You know, and uh, Reardon is not, he doesn't have psychological problems other than that, you know, stoical attitude. Uh, it, it, repression is not to be morally judged and, and none of the defenses, procrastination. Now, if you give in to procrastination, that can involve evasion, but it, even that doesn't have to. So there are a lot of, um, uh, um, uh, what is the one, uh, Don Juanism uh, does not have to evolve evasion. The, the yeah, other, but, the, but the way I understand it, Harry, these categories apply to someone's sexual life in general. Because, for example, uh, going after uh, you know, going after sex for the sake of it without any other reason can be fine, irrespective of one's sexual orientation. Uh, or repression, again. as you said. Uh, say that again. What's your point there? My point is that what you say, the behavior that could be immoral hasn't got, if I understand well, with the orientation itself. It has to do with one's uh, what they go after in life, for example, oh, the, the Don Juan thing. Yeah, the Don Juan thing you made, for example, someone who says my aim is to sleep with 21 women in 2021 would fall under the same category, in which case the problem is not with his sexuality, the problem is how, with how he views life. Do I get this right? Not exactly. There comes a point, if you say, my goal is to sleep at 21 and, and you're over 21, <laughs> sleep with, so you're old enough to know better. The goal is to sleep with 21 women in 2021. I don't think you can arrive at that goal rationally. Oh, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying, that it's irrational and that's immoral at the end of the day. Yeah, it's not yeah, good well, for you. Immorality is irrationality, evasion, blanking out. Okay, so... The question is, can we say as philosophers that you have to blank out in order to do X activity? And in some cases we can, robbery, murder, uh, supporting uh, 
Immanuel Kant's philosophy, uh, revolting against reason, any philosophy that revolts against modern art. Leonard wrote about uh, necessarily evil pursuits. Uh, you have to blank out. Even there, there are differences in how much you have to blank out. Many uh, hobbyists who practice non-objective painting are just following the trend. And so they're guilty of non-thinking more than blanking out. But anyway, it's a psychological issue, what you have to do to yourself in order to have a certain psychological problem. And I regard homosexuality as a psychological problem, but it's not a crippling one. But why? Well, because I think it's a rebellion against the, I think there is such thing as a masculine sexual identity, a feminine sexual identity. This is what Ayn Rand thought also. And if you um, don't accept the one that you were born into, uh, there's something wrong. There's no good reason for that. But so can you also say defense. the opposite? Huh? Can you also say the opposite? That actually it is the most individualist thing you can do because you don't you don't accept that your orientation is, so your nature, so to speak, is leading you towards something that you don't want. So why not see it as something that is actually pursuing your values? Not only that you do the ultimate yeah. individualist yeah. leap. Let's take, a, let's take a, a, a sensitive intellectual artistic kid who sees the, a, a, this, as the standard John Wayne, right? And he doesn't want to be that. And it's in the name of his identity and values that he rebels against the standards that are offered to him. Uh, that's an act of self-assertion. And there are a lot of homosexualities that someone put Cole Porter into the uh, chat. Uh, I'm sure that's was his psycho Adrian, why are there so many artistic types that are homosexual? Because artistic types are looked upon as that by our intellectuals too. Hospers was a philosopher. The intellectuals, people of the mind and, and refined feelings are looked upon as unmasculine. And if you don't know enough, which you wouldn't at age five to challenge that, you can definitely decide I'm not giving up my identity, who I am to be like John Wayne. And why is this a problem though? Uh, why is this a psychological problem? Yes. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> okay. Well, but the point there but is... Can, let's, let, by the it's way... Just, it's, it's an it's issue of psychology. Yeah, we've entered the realm, we've left the realm of philosophy. We've yeah. entered a scientific discipline which uh, has its own uh, methods and conclusions. So qua philosophy, object, this is not objectivism that we're talking exactly. about. Uh, yeah, exactly. I get it, but, but saying that it's a problem is a statement, so it means that we've entered this water. Anyway, let's go to the... Let's yeah, go but to we've, the entered it, we've entered it as individuals, not as advocates of a philosophy. Any philosophy. All right. Because I think okay. there uh, is Dr. One... Pinswanger, Dr. Pinswanger yes. and I disagree. He seems convinced that there's a psychological problem here. I'm not. I don't think so. Uh, and uh, but that's a scientific question. It's not, we're both, I think, still objectivists. Make yeah. Sense? Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, there that, is that one more, uh, okay. Nikos, there's one more philosophical issue that I want to um, make sure is out there, whether you agree with it or not. It cannot be innate. Contrary to what a lot of people say, you cannot be born with it because. It's a complex value judgment. You can no more be a born uh, lover of men or women than you could be a born lover of Rembrandt versus Dolly. It's a, it's a like art, a, a sexual attraction is a complex sum based upon evaluations and you're not born with any evaluation. Um, also, it's kind of crazy psychologically, uh, not psychologically, Biologically, um, homosexuality does not have reproductive fitness. 
So it's selected against, and you could not have, I mean, the estimates of homosexuals in the population range from 2% to 10%. You could not have that range of something so strongly selected against as non-reproduction. It's just biologically crazy. It would be eliminated. If it were genetic, well, the genes would be eliminated. Well, I, I just to push back a little bit on that, there are non-productive members of various species that serve biological only clonal roles. only only ones that are based on clones in like the the well, bees but yeah well yeah see that's it there are functioning non-reproductive members of uh biological because their genes are being reproduced by the reproducers and they're helping the reproducers reproduce because they have the identical to you know genes but well, we're not we know, like that but can we okay, know can, that... I, can I call for a time out here? So sure. the discussion started as what was the view of random homosexuality? Then it became on the view of objectivism, which is that there is no view because it doesn't get to that point. I think now the discussion has gone to a terrain where we cannot comment on because we are not experts. We, as far as I understand, we don't have someone who is an expert. So, and because these are views that I can say I disagree with, but I cannot enter a discussion, Let's keep the discussion where we can all be sure that we can comment on and that it is productive to understand the, the philosophy and the context of this discussion. So, by the way, I cannot see the questions because I'm from my phone, but I can see two people have their hands raised. So well, if I, could just uh, I see one last, it's... one last little point there on the response there. Most sexual activity is not done for reproduction. Its purpose is something else. Its purpose is non-reproductive. And so, you mean in man? Yeah, human beings. Most of the sex yeah. we have is not reproductive in purpose at all. It's a psychological uh, purpose that we have in having sex. Yeah. So it, the question is, can that psychological purpose be fulfilled in a healthy way? Um, okay, so let's, let's uh, obey what Nico said and uh, summarize the philosophical points that are part of objectivism. Uh, there are no innate value judgments there are no um, innately um, predetermined, emo predetermined emotions. There are innately, pre uh, all of our bodily sensations are innately uh, pre-programmed. That's why when you jab a pen into your hand, it hurts. It hurts for everybody, regardless of his psychology. So, but uh, whether you're like, one painter or another, one sexual partner or another is the result of uh, learning and, and uh, evaluations. So philosophy says there's no genetic sexual orientation. Uh, philosophy says you cannot judge an emotion. Philosophy says sex is good. Philosophy says you cannot um, use force to stop sexual behavior that you don't approve of if it's between consenting adults. And I think that covers uh, that it's, and that is, yeah, it's not immoral uh, because it's not, it's, philosophy cannot establish the degree, if any, of evasion leading to it or required to engage in it. It's not, it's just, not judgeable philosophically. So uh, that's what philosophy says. Okay. All right. So let's go to the questions from the audience. So the first question is by someone with a profile pic with a guitar, but I cannot read the name because I can't. It's a different language or something, or at least that's how I see it from my phone. Uh, Nadav, that would be you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So first thing about Rachmanin of having uh, too much conflict in his music, I remember it being uh, Beethoven, not Rachmaninoff. Am I wrong? Or is it like both uh, ones? That was like a little point. I couldn't hear much of that. 
not so sure he said that the point about uh, the musician who had struggled within was Beethoven and not Rachmaninoff. Now he I don't understand had... what you said. <laughs> <laughs> We're making progress. Well, Ayn Rand did say some things about Beethoven's sense of life that she didn't like. Um, yeah. But I'm not sure what he was asking. What, what is the question? Are you still with us, Nadi? Okay. Yeah, Nadav, do you want to try again? Okay, let's go to the next question till we get him uh, till we get him back. Also, just to uh, say, wait, there's a, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pushback, as I can see in the comments, uh, with uh, the comment that there is uh, the, that a it is a psychological problem, or b that uh, that it has something to do the fact that it's not natural. But I think we we did a lot of pushback to Harry. He said his opinion. We established that there is disagreement. So let's go to the next uh, to the next question, Stephanie. You muted, Stephanie. There we go. You muted again. There. Hello, I'm open now. Yeah. Yes. I can, I can be heard. Okay, I, I want to push back a little on the idea that philosophy is the right field to say whether uh, sexual orientation is genetic or not. Now, how you feel about discovering that you have a, a romantic attraction to someone of the same gender as yourself is your value judgment area. And, and if you dislike the fact that you feel those feelings, you're going to have a problem. Yes. But to discover, to actually have the feelings that, that they're there and that they're there from birth, they're genetic, I think is, uh, is a nature's way of uh, building in um, population control. That a certain segment what? of the population, what? because what? there's no population control building by nature. That's by well, but but it hear me through. It it makes sense that if you find what's the reason, because as a species that if out of control, you use up all the resources before your mind catches up to you. It's like why might it be? Why might it be that way? That a certain small percentage. Uh, also, that if that if people who can't reproduce because they're attracted to the same gender would then be available, like with the penguins that someone posted at HBL, that the male penguins who pair up together look after the orphaned little penguins, so that you have this where they're not reproducing, they help look after the young, and it's a way of just bit of population control, not a lot, 10%. Now we're most, getting into biology, Stephanie. Yeah, I so love it's Stephanie. Not philosophy. So Stephanie the point works is, for me and we, we, we chat every night, but <laughs> this is bad biology, but it's an issue of biology. It's very bad okay, biology. Okay, but then it means philosophy doesn't have something. Philosophy and will say. And, just, and as I say, Stephanie, just to start with, the identical twin studies and separated at birth identical twin studies are really, really powerful evidence. It is not simple genetics. It is simply not a, a simple matter of genetics. You can share someone's DNA identically. And, you know, they even questioned it. People, you know, people said, oh, that's just self-reported uh, sexual preference. Maybe some of the straight reporters are, are hiding and stuff. So they do the pupillometers and they actually look at genital uh, activity. And so even on those things, we find that self-reports are actually quite reliable. You know, better than average. Okay, and, but we uh, haven't finished discovering everything there is to know about DNA. So that's, that's true. But identical so twin, but identical twins can have, it can correctly identify, and at a large percentage, I mean, there is a relationship, right? There's a correlation, but clearly not causation. Clearly not. Oh. Moreover, what Dr. Binswanger said is true. It involves cognitions. There are certain cognitions that must underlie. Uh, you know, conclusions like that and evaluations and emotions like that. It's not, it's not precognitive, like a patella reflex or something. Yeah. And we know from identical twin studies, they just don't line up. So, I mean, it's, it's at the outer limits. That's why I likened it to Rembrandt, Dolly. It's at the outer limits of higher abstractions and wide integrations you make about yourself and people and the world. It's, it would be more plausible 
uh, to say that there's an innate desire for bananas. <laughs> you can at least see a banana and you can imagine that in the state of early evolution, it was food for the monkeys we came from. But that, that turns out to be false. But to say, it's like, uh, I have a gene for programming. I just love programming. I have a, an attraction to it. I love looking at circuit boards. I see a circuit board, I have an immediate, you know, those green and you were born Oh, that boy. <laughs> and you were born that way. <laughs> I was born that way. So, my gene. so I don't know. I think it obviously is a developmental issue. It may have to do with attachment patterns with our caregivers. It may have to do with conclusions we reach about ourselves as boys or girls, as I say, long before we really learn where babies come from. Uh, but it's not simply genetics. I think. Okay, we can, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question on this? Because again, I want to direct the discussion a bit on things that are beyond biology or psychology. Because to be honest, they're of little interest to me and for many of the people in the comments. We understand. So I remember having a discussion with a leftist some years ago, and I said, look, why do you people make the focus so much on the argument that I was born this way? So they say, look, you conservatives need to accept uh, homosexuality because people are born this way. And I said, why not frame it as it's your life, you can do whatever you want, which is good for you and rational for you, and no one has a right to, to have a say on your life one way or the other. Right. And the argument he gave me is that, well, no, okay, I get what you're saying, but uh, it's a better winning argument to say that uh, I was born this way or whatever. So my question is this, why, why does it even matter whether it is a choice or whether it is something innate? Because That's at the end of the question. day- that's a good question. Can I speak to that? Because in a way, it doesn't matter. In a way, it does. It doesn't matter for morality. It doesn't matter uh, in your judgment of somebody, whether he reached this psychology at age five by, you know, understandable means, or he was born that way. In either way, are you going to judge him? Oh, he's bad because he's gay. That's, that's not right. But it matters for epistemology because the doctrine of no innate ideas and the theory of emotions in philosophy, that emotions are the result of value judgments and value judgments are learned. That's important about the view of man and epistemology. Right. James? Right. The interesting emotion here for me, whether it's, you know, Psychology is outside the realm of moral evaluation if we're just talking about the emotional manifestation. And that's really the important thing to note here. <laughs> it is uh, an important part of objectivism. Another important part that Dr. Binswanger points out, though, is that our emotions are informed by our cognitions. Now, when we're young and we don't know a lot, we can make poor decisions. Not always. Sometimes our psychology is informed by mental evasions that we have. And that's sometimes hard to pull, sort out. But the point is that psychology is not philosophy. And a, a psychology as such cannot be morally evaluated unless you knew exactly all the thinking that went into, right? right. The question is, it's not a choice. And so long as it's not a choice, uh, it's not- Now, in the evaluated. present. In right. the present, it's not a choice. Right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, and, in my own experience, uh, I, I, there I want to really add something. In my own experience, I have seen relationships, long term homosexual relationships, which are some of the most beautiful relationships I have ever seen. And from my outside, and now obviously I don't, I'm just an outside observer looking at these long term homosexual relationships. Uh, I've never had a long term homosexual relationship. But the point is, looking at the outside, all the indicia that I have from that. And this is, I know my own personal empirical experience, but it at least informs me that something positive, something healthy in a way, something even beautiful in a way can manifest in homosexual love. Um, now, everyone's got a right to their own opinion. Dr. Binswanger can say, two guys holding hands, yucky. He has a right to say that. That's his emotion. It is outside the realm of moral evaluation just as much as my moral evaluation of a homosexual couple holding hands could actually indicate something aesthetically beautiful to me. But wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. To Why is such an evaluation outside 
of the terrain of moral evaluation. So if someone says, let's say, I don't like gay. Why? Why, Why is this outside of, of the terrain of moral evaluation? Do you like, do you like chocolate milkshakes? But I, I have do. a reason if I don't like it. <laughs> Some people like liver. You have a reason? You don't have a reason. It tastes good to you. That's, not, that's outside the realm of moral evaluation. Anything How that's is not this a the choice. Same? I don't because... get it. Choice. Sorry? Well, as Aristotle pointed out more than 2,000 years ago, to morally evaluate something, it has to be a subject of choice. If a person doesn't have a choice, it's not a uh, subject to moral evaluation. I can't blame you, Nikos, for being born Greek. It's something you can't control, can't fix, can't do anything about. And since it's outside the realm of your volition, it is not something I can morally evaluate you, Nikos, on. Now, I love Greek culture and, and you know, so forth and so on. There are all kinds of other connotations to it. But you being born a Greek as such, it's outside the realm of moral evaluation. Yeah, yeah but, but saying, that I don't like, saying that I don't like Greeks is not outside the terrain of moral evaluation. It's an irrational statement because right. it takes Greeks as a group to begin with. And B, there needs to be some backstory on what is your moral right. judgment that tells you I don't like that. That's why, that's why I'm saying I don't think it's outside of the terrain of moral evaluation. Look, uh, somebody likes Beethoven. Okay, let's say that, that Iron is right, or you pick a gloomy thing that to, when you listen to, you think it's, God, I wouldn't want to be around that much. That is, I wouldn't want to spend time in that universe of that music. Uh, that's, but they like it. That's not subject to moral evaluation. Their musical preferences. Now, let's say that they um, they got there because, as an adolescent, they used their minds in in a certain way that was good or a certain way that was bad. But now they're 42 years old. What difference does it make? Yeah, if I, had, if I had stood up for myself more when I was 12, I probably wouldn't like this music, let's say, that you could show. But it's irrelevant now. And you, so you wouldn't judge a person's, uh, morally, a person's musical preferences or food preferences or uh, um, Many, many things in life are value. Values and moral values are not coincident. Okay. Right. Right. Key point. Okay. But let how me restate the question. An, and how we would evaluate an adult about their use of cognition is, I think, a little different than how we would evaluate a five to 10 year old about how they're using their cognition that might be yeah. psychology. Okay. But let me restate then the question. I, I want to stress this because I don't want to avoid the difficult questions. Saying that I don't personally like, for example, I don't like gay people. Why is this not collectivism? Because you cannot say, oh, that's just the taste. Because someone can say, oh, I don't like right. Asians, for example. Now we're going Why is this to, not the same kind need, of collectivism? Now we need another distinction that Ayn Rand made that's not um, publicly known by, you know, accident. Um, I like to tell the story. Forgive me, those of you who've heard it three times. I was in Ayn Rand's apartment, and she told me her cat had knocked over something, and that's why it was there, or scratched up something. And I said, bad cat. And she said, no, good cat who took a bad action. Okay, so you don't, nobody is saying, I don't like homosexuals. I mean, that would be like a, a skinhead response, or I don't like Greeks, or I don't like Asians. That, that's collectivism, irrational. You can say, I don't like that behavior that some people engage in. Now, I don't, I have a lot of, you know, not insignificant number of homosexual friends. Uh, so I would never say I don't like gay people. That's like, would you say I don't like procrastinators, even though that's a volitional group? I, I don't like uh, rationalists. Well, maybe, but that would be crazy, a crazy thing to say, because people have uh, what people do and a certain aspect of them is not necessarily their essence. And you respond to a person for their essential qualities, 
not every little thing about them, whether it was volitional or not. So I, no one is saying, I don't like gay people. That would be wrong. Wow. Sorry, Harry, I cannot get it. I'll have to maybe to release and I cannot get what's the difference between I don't like gay people and I don't like the sexual behavior of gay people. Like, I don't get it. But anyway, let's go to the questions well, one, of the audience. Can, well, wait, 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 Nikos, oh, on that point. Yeah. There can be sexual things that your perfectly straight friends might be into that you're not into, but they have nothing to do with your evaluation of them. I mean, that is to say, if a friend of yours said, you know, I like uh, romantic moonlit dinners, you know, before sex, or I like, you know, to play a certain kind of music before that really is what I enjoy. That is you know, like that music? I mean, that a romantic place? Oh, I don't like those places. But that wouldn't be the fact that you don't share those values and don't have the same emotional reactions doesn't mean you evaluate the person negatively, does it? Okay, I get that. But I can say, for example, I'm not, I don't like masochism. I'm what? talking about something very specific. What? But saying I don't like the whole package. Masochism. Oh, masochism. masochism. Yeah. But saying I don't like the whole package of a sexual behavior of like I don't get it. But anyway, there's this that's that's why I'm the moderator and not on the panel. I just well, uh, but, but, but like what I say, if someone could say to me, and this is the way I look at it, if someone I'm gonna use a just a cliche example, using whipped cream during sex. <laughs> someone says, ooh, that's really exciting and sexy to me. And someone else says, ooh, I think that's yucky. I, would that have any moral significance that someone was liked using whipped cream during sex and another person didn't like using whipped cream during sex, just to use some weird concrete? Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But saying, for example, I don't like anything that my friends do on 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 the bed that sounds a bit weird but anyway okay i've that's we're we're going seriously okay i see three raised hands i see i think that's again a dev from from a different account i see sam and i see amy let's go so nadav if it's hey, can you, you hear me now yes now we can hear you yes it's me okay um I want to ask, like, when people uh -oh. think of, like, people who go against homosexuality, like, Nadav, here's the deal. I still can't hear you. The Let's difference between them and objectivists, I think, is that no objectivist, the solution is absolutely, Nadav, I can't hear you, I'll, but here's the deal. Your connection is really bad and what I can't way? hear you. Here's the deal. Can you put the question in writing and I'm going to read it out loud. We can't hear you. Your connection is really bad. Please put it in writing and we'll, we'll, we'll ask the question. Sam, you're unmuted. Hello. Um, so I'm not sure how, if my question is in, entirely uh, related, but it's actually on the question of... Um, um, Ayn Rand's response to the question of a woman president. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's a psychological uh, response uh, as opposed to a philosophical one. And also, does that um, premise necessarily mean that philosophy has nothing to say about psychology in general? Thank you. As if we haven't opened enough can of worms, here's another one. By the way, I was thinking we'd do a separate event for that we can answer it now. So uh, <clears throat> who wants to jump on that? Um, I would, um, but I'm, it, it went out of my mind because of what you said. Re restate the question for him, Nikos. Okay, the question is, so Ayn Rand made the other, oh. probably her most controversial comment on a female president and how this would not make yeah. sense. And this has to do with her view of how women psychoepistemology or I don't know how to how to call it so that was the so the question was is this something in the domain of psychology rather than in the domain of philosophy uh, and what's the relations sorry 
Yeah, go on. I just want to quickly say we will have a whole event on on this topic. Uh, but yeah, we can. Yeah, my prediction is that I'm going to be cancelled and without a job by then. So uh, I'm going to have more free time to prepare on it. But uh, the other part of the question was, what's the relationship between uh, philosophy and psychology? By the way, yeah. But, okay, yeah. So why is it why is it not? Would you say it's part of epistemology, for example, or is it maybe another branch? No, that's psychology. That's complete psychology. But what uh, a woman would want that her position was a a rational, healthy woman would not want to be the final authority over men, and she got that through introspection. As that is not a philosophical issue. No, I, th I agree. I think Ayn Rand was telling us something about her own psychology. You know, uh, Ayn Rand, you know, some people will project all kinds of psychological stuff on Ayn Rand, but it's really repulsive. Ayn Rand was not a megalomaniac. Ayn Rand was not, not, had no desire to be a cult leader. She actually, in her own mind, was a, just an honest person, really a simple and honest person who saw things. And uh, so a lot of what she'll say in these Again, you know, the, her most controversial statements, I think, are really gives us insight into her psychology, but are sometimes just outside the realm of philosophy. And you can't say that's objectivism, but you can say that's Ayn Rand. That's yeah, right. To, to be honest, for me, it would be much simpler to say from my judgment, this is, an arg this is a statement that I find wrong. So it can happen at the same time that it's not part of objectivism, but again, the, the, the good thing for me with these debates is that I don't think it's a problem to say this is a wrong argument. It would be wrong because of the time context. For example, Jefferson was wrong about slavery. But I, the only thing yeah, I can but say she about was right about I, a woman president. And I think you would agree with her if you just phrase it a little differently. OK, but let, let's leave this for the women president uh, discussion okay. then. So uh, I just had the first look on, uh, on the comments, again, because from my phone. So Melanie has given some good quotes on sex. And here's an example. To a rational man, sex is an expression of self-esteem, a celebration of his self and of existence. It seems to be that Harry's argument is that homosexuals aren't people of moral self-esteem or that they're bad, or sorry, that wow. they are, it means people of self-esteem, but they're too irrational to do it, quote, correctly. So Where do you get a that? Lot of I never said that. that. Can we have a comment on that? I never said anything like that. I mean, you know, it's interesting because um, I grew up in the 50s and some of you grew up in this millennium. And... Uh, it, when, when I grew up, uh, all this was completely non-controversial. It was well understood or well believed, if it was false, uh, that there was a masculine identity and, and a feminine identity. And uh, that they were a little bit demanding, each one, to be a, a masculine man or feminine woman, woman. It wasn't like given to everybody automatically, but you had to kind of make yourself into a masculine man by the way you lived your life or a feminine woman by the way you lived your life. And there was a lot of um, discussion in objectivism about what that consisted of. You can read it in the objectivist in Brandon's article. But today that's completely gone and people are, uh, you know, it, it is a very different culture, whether you think ours, that is my early when the 50s was wrong and you're right, or whether you say, as I would, uh, my culture was right and yours is wrong. It's very different. And you should be aware of that and, the, and that we need to find what is provable in regard to the two positions. In this regard, I, I would urge people to read the review of Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique that was done in the Objectivist newsletter. Here you had an early feminist who was you know, challenging certain ideas about the role of women in society and what the feminine mystique was. It was actually a very positive review that the Objectivist newsletter gave it. And uh, there is, I think, uh, identifiably masculine characteristics, or at least traditionally masculine characteristics, and fem traditionally 
you characterize, uh, characterize as feminine characteristics. Obviously, there's a, a tremendous overlap. You know, the fact that one is phys physically acts out or is inquisitive uh, or is aggressive and competitive uh, or even in a physical way. I don't think uh, that one could say that women don't have those characteristics any more than one could say that men don't have nurturing characteristics or, you know, uh, being concerned about other people's feelings, empathy, and those kind of characteristics. Those kind of characters can be shared by both. It's just a, simply a question of, you know, um, overlapping bell curves, really. Uh, uh, do they tend to go with one or the other? Well, you give estrogen to chimps and they start facing each other and grooming each other and getting concerned with one another. You give testosterone to chimps and suddenly they get curious and they start physically acting out and climbing over things and start fighting with each other. Th that's just the actual physical difference. There's a tendency in the two different genders to be to have certain characteristics. This doesn't mean that they're the exclusive property. Any of those characteristics are the exclusive properties of those genders, but surely there is just physically certain characteristics which are the result of the physicality of being male or the physicality of being female, which are at least tendencies that go with one or the other. That's the most I can do on that. Uh, see, <laughs> see, James is from a, a border line culture. So I wouldn't agree with that conceptualization. Um, that's too modern for me. Uh, there, it, there are, in the article in The Objectivist, and this was published under Ayn Rand's editorship, so she thought it was right. There are three factors that are um, set to underline the psychosexual difference. The differences in, in sexual identity between masculine and femininity masculinity and femininity, three factors. One, the male is generally stronger and, and generates more energy. That's the physical factor. And that does overlap. You know, some women are stronger than some men, but the average is between boys and girls is quite a difference. Uh, the second is that the man is the active initiator in sex. The other two have to do with the sexual act. Uh, the man is the active initiator. He's more in control with, of what happens in the sex act than the woman is. And, the, uh, and he penetrates the woman rather than the woman is, is being penetrated. And the third is it depends upon the man's interest, upon the man's will, because he has to get an erection. So it depends on, uh, and then the question was raised, well, what about homosexual sex? It doesn't, you know, some of, there's not that same thing there. Uh, and that's, that objection wasn't considered. I can, I can speak to that, but I don't, I don't want to get into that now. Yeah, uh, let's, 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 but that's the biology. Because we are preempting a future event. So we're going to have a whole event on uh, whether Rand was right on her view on the masculine and the feminine. So let's okay. let's pause it here. It's, it's sorry to, to interrupt you both. Sure. So I promised Nadav I'd, I'd read his written question because he tried to ask it twice. So he says, whether it's a disorder or not, abstinence can be the solution, right? So if you have bad premises causing so homosexuality, you could, should just work on your premises. By the way, I don't think anyone said that, but anyway. And do sex how you like it. Agreed. Even if you have a fetish, which is technically a sexual disorder, that would be the same. I'm not sure at all that fetish is a sexual disorder. I mean, a fetish can be super fun. So, but anyway, yeah, I interject. Yeah, 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 my... yeah. Do you, you mean sexual taste, sexual act, certain activities you prefer, a certain way of approaching sex? That how how can the individual differences really be a moral? I mean, honestly, the the point of good but, sex is to let yourself kind of be spontaneous in the moment and express yourself you don't it's not an intellectual process uh it's being who you are in that moment um but uh, yeah. i think i hijacked the question sorry Nadav. so his question is abstinence is not the solution right right never i would yeah. i would not condemn anyone to sexual abstinence pleasure is a psychological need for human beings right. we could say philosophically right romantic love is a need 
for human beings. We can't always get it, find it, but it's a need. And I, and finding that a value like that, I think is very important for human beings. And if you like some music that is in fact malevolent, it doesn't make any difference. You should listen to it and enjoy it. Get in touch with yourself. Uh, certain things are for pleasure, art, sex, friendship are for pleasure, food, uh, as long as it doesn't have health consequences, you should take part in it. Right. Let's go to, to more questions. Amy, let me see how I can unmute you from here. Yeah, you're unmuted. And then we'll go to Lee. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I think I agree with um, pretty much everything that was said by the speakers. And I want to ask them. Wait, the speakers disagree on some points. <laughs> I agree with everything that they that's said. Why, yeah, that's why hey, I said I'll pretty much. I knew, I knew, much. I knew you are going to pick up, pick up on that. But uh, I knew they, the, there were some things, obviously, that they disagreed on. But I don't think they were, it was, wasn't very major things. Um, so there's one point that they bef definitely agreed on and reiterated, and if it felt like they needed to reiterate it, which was that the that you can't morally judge someone's emotions per se. Right. And I, and I agree with that. And I I, I want to ask sort of a side question to that, which is the issue of uh, homosexuality. I think someone can be legitimately um, sensitive about someone expressing disapproval of it simply because of the historical context. So the fact that they were, that they in the past and in the present have been uh, persecuted and there's been injustices um, committed against them. Don't you think that that sort of, oh, uh, it would make it so that anyone who expresses disapproval of any aspect of it, you know, um, would consider the fact that, you know, it's uh, that the person hearing that, that criticism will possibly connect it with, uh, will need to hear reassurance that this person doesn't think this thing should be illegal, doesn't think it should be, that it is immoral, that they have no problem with homosexuals, that they, that, you know, it's, I, I think that's an issue in, in this conversation that people are, I would say, overly sensitive now because right mm -hmm. now in the West, you shouldn't really think that homosexuality is under attack. So right, I, I would say that, that that's kind of a psychological problem with people having, not accepting your arguments that this is a thing of taste, a matter of taste and you're, you're, not, you're not saying that it's a- uh, um, you make a really illegal. good point, and it's applicable to more than just this. Uh, you know, uh, because there's been racism, discrimination, slavery, Jim Crow, there's certain areas that you just cannot scientifically investigate. For example, race and IQ. I don't think I don't think there's much there. But to raise the issue, but to raise the issue at all, can't talk about. Or with homosexuality, you can say it should be legal. I, I'm not going to judge someone for their emotions. But on the other hand, oh, well, if you're going to say anything psychological about it, even if you're a psychologist and that's your field of expertise, it's a subject that can be discussed, surely. It's a subject that can be debated. And what I really don't like about our contemporary world is someone raises a scientific question, which as such is just a scientific question. Wh what do we know about the psychology of same-sex attraction? What do we know, say, about race and its other you know, characteristics? There are certain subjects that are just off limits to even scientific questioning, and that's wrong. That's just wrong. The mere fact that there's been political you know, persecution and discrimination does not mean that a scientific question is not subject to investigation and analysis. Harry, have you got a comment or shall we go to Lee? Totally. Okay, Lee, give me a second. I think you're unmuted. Very good, thank you. Uh, very interesting, gentlemen. I, I wanted to get back to this issue, which has come up before in other contexts of that Harry brought up of um, sexual preference being a matter of concept, uh, conceptual evaluation. 
purely. And I don't think, uh, here I have to bring in the science a little bit here. I don't think the science is consistent with that. I would take what James said about twin studies and flip it around. Uh, I'd summarize the findings of the twin studies. Now, I'm not a behavior geneticist. And we don't want to get deeply into the science, as Nikos has said, but I'll, I'll just say what I know, which is a little bit. Uh, I think the summary of the findings of the twin studies is identical twins have a higher concordance of sexual preference than fraternal twins. And that indicates some kind of something going on genetically. Also, there was a recent study. Um, I don't know, remember all the details, but it's one of these ge genome-wide association studies that have been done, for example, with intelligence recently, where you have like hundreds of thousands of participants and they actually identify particular genes that are connected with particular traits. In this case, uh, it was found that uh, homosexuality is not a single gene, it's polygenic, but that's not surprising. But there was a genetic association. There were particular genes they could point to and a larger study would probably find more. And I, I find that, I find, I wanna know what the philosophical reason why that can't be true. I don't think that's right because well, actually well, if sexual preference. Genetic, look, if they found a genetic correlation between uh, uh, say a gene and say, liking you, you know other take something else that could be conceptual that you would think of the all the things that could happen in that correlation that could line them up could there be a gene let's take I, i'm not sure i agree with it but let's take harry's uh, scenario about the development of homosexuality you could imagine that scenario being played out because a per, uh, say a young boy is physically less strong or physically uh less aggressive and so because of that genetic uh, aspect, there's a correlation to him making that conceptual, you see, the fact that there's a genetic yeah. correlation yeah. does not necessarily mean that it, we're skipping cognition. <laughs> it just means that that physicality it, it, has a tendency. It, doesn't, and, it right? doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that. I think that uh, the, I think the burden of proof is on someone who wants to offer that other explanation. The burden of proof is there to show that that's the case. I don't think in, in the case of uh, sexuality that it's that complicated a thing that it requires conceptual evaluation. I actually think it's quite simple and fairly perceptual level stuff. Uh, it's not, it's not right. a difficult uh, well, what would question it be? at all. What would it be? The way, the way females look, the way they sound. Uh, with mice, it's, it's actually the odor of the females. And I don't know if that's true for humans necessarily, but it's, it's, I think they're fairly simple factors. Now, none of these things necessarily account account 100%. I'm not saying that it's impossible for conceptual factors to come into play. I, I think I think they do. But to say that it has to be 100% conceptual, that's what I'm objecting to. I don't think there's a uh, good reason to believe that. And I think there there's reason to single, think otherwise. There isn't a single emotion that is uh, known to be based upon genetic factors. And I gave the example of the bananas. You say, well, that's very simple. That surely that will be an eight. That's the difference, but that's where man doesn't have instinct. I, I, part of this is a burden of proof issue. How do we know that in the face well, of the fact that well, there are- Well, we know that it is not right. simple genetics because the very studies that you show, you said you flipped yeah. them up, upside down, but if it was yeah. a matter of genetics, then it would be one-to-one -one no, correlation. No, but this is a false, this is a More false than alternative. That. Separated, not, nobody well, nobody well, says it's 100% genetic. Nobody. Okay. There's nobody so on know, it's not. Oh, so we know it's not. No, so not a, yeah. nobody, no, nobody yes, says it's 100%. Yes, absolutely. I was born not, this way. Yeah, I, people say that all the time. People say it, but they don't say it's 100%, or at least- I've never seen it. Let's put it this way: no scientist has ever said that I've I've ever read that it's one hundred percent that anything. Well, the, it, when the, you're talking about genetics versus environment and other factors, they don't the say fact, that. The the but the uh, mere the fact that there's that a correlation. But the mere fact that there is a correlation, and now notice the difference: identical twins raised in different environments have a lower correlation. Identical twins raised in the same environment but have a still, higher correlation, but, and but, still not a perfect correlation yeah so of course. environment <laughs> is a factor as well yeah, yeah right? of course as i said so everybody knows that 
I took you guys. I take, or at least I take Harry. I don't know for sure in your case, James. But if it I was physical, Harry be, how would cognition take, have any effect? I, I take t- Harry to be denying that there is any genetic factor whatsoever. I yes. think he's taking that position, and that yes. position I don't think is tenable. Well, I don't think so. I don't. I don't. Uh, you know, it's it's false, but I I can't help but believe it. Yeah. Well, uh, well determine it. I got the well, gene. Well, let's, take, let's, take another, well, let's take another. Well, let's take another. I got the gene. Let's, yeah. let's take yeah, something yeah, altogether yeah. different. Let's take uh, an example like transvestism. Here, there's a sexual pleasure or a sense of pleasure that comes from dressing like the opposite sex. It is felt as an innate emotion, and yet what it is to dress as the opposite sex is a purely cognitively learned thing that varies from society to society. So, well, if someone were to say, to... so wait. If someone were to say to you, my being a transvestite is so innate in me that I think, and if it, since we find a genetic correlation, obviously my genes are somehow making me want to put on a skirt as a man. No, that's obviously a cogn- cognitive thing because what it means to dress as the opposite sex is a socially variant, co- cognitively discovered thing. So you can feel the desire as an innate desire, as an automatic, I've really, this is what really gives me pleasure. And it not have really no direct genetic causation, even if there I, is a genetic correlation. What do you Gentlemen, mean? Gentlemen, we have another yeah. question. Shall we proceed? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I, I'll leave it at that. I don't think there's a proof that it's all uh, conceptual. I think that that's, what, that's what's lacking here. I don't see any proof that it's genetic either. Well, no, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying it's genetic. I'm saying it's uh, that as far as we know, the best, as far as the best science we have, there is some contribution from both uh, what, what you you're calling to positive factors. We find out and, and from the people involved what they introspect about the, the way that it makes them feel and how they feel yeah. about themselves and what they feel about men and what they feel about women and when they yeah. n- notice this coming on. Let's, let's get some introspective data. I'm, I'm all for that, of course. Yeah, and I, I gotcha. Think, all right. <laughs> and I think I know how that would come out in my case. I don't think I did it. I don't, I think I, I was aware of the difference and the significance of the difference before doing any conceptual evaluation of it. That's what I think. But anyway, okay. I, I guess I've made my point. Nikos wants to move ahead. All right. So let's say, first of all, I can't see super chats on YouTube makes a, uh, if you ask a super chat on YouTube, Razi put it to me on uh, on on the Slack. So I see Francesco has his hand raised. Francesco, you are unmuted. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, I've been listening, and basically, it's I can hear always the same thing: is it nature or nurture? Uh, which is a false perspective. I think we've got to detach ourselves a little bit because they both assume that it's a mistake whether it's because you had the wrong education or because you had the wrong genes you're a gay and that is a mistake that's unnatural if you look at nature all animals have got a percentage of gay uh, of gay people in all in a homosexual relationship every animal uh, so uh, how can you say something that is present in every uh, social uh, group of animals is unnatural? Obviously, nature intended something about it. And, and as it's been working and going on through the millions of years, in spite of homosexuality, probably one side of homosexuality doesn't damage the species in itself. And maybe it's even advantageous for the survival of the species. And I gave the example of the penguins. The fact that uh, in the South Pole, there are a couple of male penguins that take care of the chick if the parents die, brings a survival of the, of the penguins and increases survival. If every uh, penguin mated, then you find you would have more chicks, but then when they parents died, the the, chi- the chicks would die. Instead, being a number of uh, couples that do not 
a mate and do not make chicks, they can look after other people's chicks. And that happens in every species, like I was quoting elephants. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, sisters of the mother that don't have babies and they look after their sister's baby because it's a very serious task to look after, after, after a baby. So if every female had a baby, they wouldn't be able to take care of other babies. So uh, maybe nature intended that there is a, a percentage of homosexual people. So, so what? This, this is really, it comes from this, uh, uh, straight from the, the vision of the Bible, where they say men made, God made them male and female. No, God made, made male and female and homosexuals that would not procreate, but would still look after the society. That's it. Thank you. And actually, I don't want to put it in terms of evolutionary advantage or disadvantage, but a story I found always very fascinating was if you know ancient uh, Thiva, Thebes, the, the city in Greece, their special army unit was the sacred band of soldiers, which was 300 soldiers, which were all gay couples, basically, lovers with each other, and they were, they were a force to be reckoned with. So you could say that within that context, it was an advantage. So, yeah, I don't think that... Uh, There's an it ultra-male, as... ultra-masculine in traditional understanding environment. And, and actually, I don't... Yeah. Yeah, and actually, I don't want to open another trajectory here, but there's a very strong part of the so-called manosphere or people about uh, who, who are into masculinity who are themselves gay. So it's it has nothing or very little to do. I don't know what, where is the spell is, but it is, there is no correlation between being gay and being feminine. And again, see the warriors, for example, in ancient Greece, or see, see the Spartan, uh, the Spartan lover, uh, what was the, anyway, I have the Greek name in my, in my mind. Now, the interesting thing is that today, many uh, right-wing traditionalists are gonna say, no, 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 we've misunderstood these things. These people were just very good friends. <laughs> actually, I think the majority, the majority of the evidence is that, no, these were actually lovers. For people who are more interested on this, check out Sacred Band of Thebes to find out more about that. And just one comment about the natural, right, and whether or not other animal species do that. Look, human beings are different. We have a different form of cognition. We are not like animals in one way, right? Everything we do has this new capacity, this conceptual capacity that it goes through that other animals don't generally have. So when other animals are doing that, I kind of say, so what when it comes to human behavior? On the other hand, when you say, well, this is nature, Again, I say, so what? Human beings transcend nature. We were not, uh, there's nothing evolved or natural about walking on the moon. There's nothing evolved or natural about genetic engineering or splitting an atom. Human beings are not restricted to what uh, has been biologically anticipated. Quite the opposite, quite the opposite. So the mere fact that something is, uh, you know, uh, in nature, will not the animals do it won't impress me about what humans uh, what's natural or good in human beings one way or another on the other hand your natural argument hey it's unnatural to do x y or z well it's not natural you know you say it's not normal well geniuses aren't normal normality is not the standard of value either is it so exactly i think those kind of questions are not really relevant here uh the, the question is can a human being get the value that romantic love is uh, in a same-sex relationship. Um, in my experience, they can, and that's what really matters from the ethical standpoint. You talk about other issues, you know, like promiscuity or taking it seriously or being dishonest. Well, those apply to everybody. Those apply to straight relationships, gay relationships, whatever your relationship is. Honest relationships are what's gonna serve you. Dishonest relationships will not serve your long-term interest, promiscuity and taking sex seriously. Well, now you're not taking yourself seriously or getting the best, best out of sex. It's love, it's a long-term relationship that you really are gonna get the most out of. And those are issues that transcend the issue of gay or straight. 
they apply to everybody. Uh, I want to make some philosophical points. Uh, I applaud J James for that statement. Um, it's not nature or nurture. It's choice. Choice is the, is the controlling factor. It's, if you like, choice is the fundamental that works through both nature and nurture. For, for instance, nurture. You don't have to believe what mommy and daddy tell you. You don't have to believe what your society believes around you. Uh, nature, nature doesn't control your thinking. Nature gives you a capacity. It gives you a superlative machine, as Ayn Rand described it. But the direction you give that machine is up to your volitional choice. So it's not nature or nurture. And I don't accept the argument that um, homosexuality is unnatural. That's not nature. Natural is too, as, as James pointed out, is too rubbery a term. Uh, it, it, I cited some facts that masculinity, that give rise to a masculine psychology, or at least that was thought so in the era of the objectivist. Uh, but it's not just, just to say, well, it's not natural. It's not an argument. And in a way, the, the argument from animals is also saying it's not natural. So let's, let's leave that out. Okay, it's not nature, it's not nurture at root, it's choice. And there's neither side should appeal to uh, what's natural. That's not an argument. Right. So Bob says that my comment on the sacred uh, band of, theme, of Thebes it leans towards collectivism. I'm not sure why, but anyway. Uh, we have one more hand raised, so who is that? Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Nikos, I meant to say uh, what, what um, Francesco said is correct. Uh, the homosexuality, in my understanding, is not femininity. It's not that the, the male homosexual is feminine. Uh, it's something different. So right. I agree with that. Okay. So let's go to Reed and then uh, Bob. Hi, so um, I just, I came in a bit late, so I missed some stuff, but um, I just wanted to ask, so we've been talking about homosexuality, but it seems like I don't, or I asked the chat and they said that we haven't brought up bisexuality yet. So I would like to ask both of the speakers if there are any points that they've made that, or any way in which they're, this discussion would change in that context versus homosexuality. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to start with that? Well, you know, sex is good. Love is good, right? And if that is a, a premise of objectivism and platonic love is wrong, it's wrong not to act in the appropriate way on your values. If your values are that high, and if it is that kind of a value, and if there's some reciprocation, go for it. You should go for it. Uh, so, in fact, from bisexuality, one could take the perspective of why is anyone limiting themselves? Maybe the more interesting psychological issue is not the attraction, but the disattraction. That Ooh, the yucky, you know, I don't want to have sex with my sister feeling that we all have about various other things. Where does that icky yucky feeling come from? I think that serves some kind of biological function. And so we have this icky yucky thing capacity, but it's an icky yucky capacity to say, no, I don't. I'm definitely not going to have sex with that. Uh, so uh, it's a fascinating question. There's interaction with it. But the bisexual might say, hey, why limit yourself at all? Why cut off half the population? Uh, if there are subtle differences of, of value that you get from having sex with a, someone of the same sex and they're, say, qualitatively different, then what, what you'd say, well, why would I limit myself to either? Um, I would so be tempted here to throw in the issue of polarity, but uh, my prediction is that this is going to be the theme on the other discussion on uh, Rand's view on the female president and all that stuff. So, well, let's Especially it if it now. transcends masculinity and femininity. That is to say, if you, why not, 
Yeah, and this is one way you could understand it. Why not get the value of the masculine and the feminine potentially in your life? Yeah, but still polar. Anyway, yeah, let's forget polarity okay. for the other discussion. Yeah, because I have. Uh, I, feel, I feel uh, obligated to to tell you what the uh, I think Ayn Rand's position was, but the way it was discussed in objectivist circles lower down at the time was that bisexuality is more divorced from reality than homosexuality because the person doesn't see the difference between male and female. Now that, you know, begs a lot of questions, but that is, it was, it was really looked down on. Well, okay. I, I just have to chime in here. Uh, and maybe with a confession of my own, I just don't see that at all. I, from my own introspective standpoint, I just don't see that. I can see some, uh, in fact, the difference can be vital. The excellence, the arite of the male being masculine, or the arite of the female being feminine might be both of each of the things that you're responding to as a bisexual. In other words, it's not that you're unaware, you're acutely aware of the difference. Mm -hmm. And in the cases when you're, in each of those cases, you are responding to the difference in different ways. I don't, right. I don't know. I'm just reporting. Right. So am I. I don't know. I don't, I, it rubs me the wrong way, but it gets so psychological that it's hard to. It enters uh, this new realm. Yeah. Bob. You're unmuted. And I see Francesco has a, uh, has a follow-up. I thought yours was a legacy hand. We'll get back to you if there's time for... By the way, if someone wants to have a question, this is a, a last round, as they say, in the pub. Okay. Two points. One, uh, Nikos, the reason that your uh, homosexual crowd lovers were uh, supporting collectivism is that your argument for that was that the collective was better off, not that individuals were better off. So uh, second point is that I wanna emphasize uh, something that Harry was not saying, does not believe. Uh, and that is that you don't explicitly choose to be gay or not. And yet whether or not you are gay is in fact the result of choice, volition. It just happens to be a whole lot of choices, as James was saying much earlier, that you make before you were even able to tell the difference between gay and non-gay. It, it's like you don't choose to have your particular sense of life, but you do choose your sense of life because it's a summation of a lot of choices that you've made before. So. That's a good, good comparison. Yeah, that's an excellent point, and um, I should have made that. That's... Uh... Because the uh, people I argue with say, well, look, I didn't choose to be a homosexual or he or she didn't choose to be a homosexual. That, that's just where they find themselves. Yeah. But a lot of little choices added up to your soul. So it is chosen indirectly, not as a, a direct object. You don't choose to be a fan of Rachmaninoff's music or an opponent of it. I mean, in terms of what you like, but you, your choices that you make result in that. And, and that's why analyzing homosexuality is so tough because it's the same reason. I mean, you can analyze a single emotion that you have. Usually you can find out you know, what are the values that I have? What did I identify? But to say, why is it that I like the opposite sex? That's extremely complex. And it may be beyond, uh, certainly psychologists don't know how to figure that out yet for every case. Yeah, see, the way I can look at it from one perspective is I look at my relationship with my wife and I can say, she's absolutely my top value, but look how physically convenient she is for my physical convenience. So it's like our bodies physically match, right? But taking that idea, <laughs> this physicality is the sort of physicality that works best with my physicality, right? That's my experience and that's, right? That's my understanding. Now, but to, that is a mature understanding. No six-year-old has that understanding. No six-year-old appreciates, like Dr. Binswanger said, the male is the penetrator and the woman is the penetratee. 
they have effect. They have a psychological effect. They have, they will have a psychological, that physical difference will have psychological manifestations. On the other hand, to a five or six year old, all such considerations are unknown. You know, there's something that Ayn Rand didn't take into account that I think is a shortcoming since I never criticize her and I'm not criticizing her for this morally, but I think there is another fact that it enters into the whole sexual psychology and that's childbearing. Because as you're talking, James, I was thinking about what, what does a six-year-old know? He, he may know that boys are tougher and rougher than girls on average, but then he knows some who aren't. So that's, that's an average thing. But he knows that girls become mommies and boys become daddies. But uh, the, the daddy role is, you know, kind of more removed from the child. So every, every girl knows that she has the capacity to be a mother. And I think that's really important in establishing uh, feminine vulnerability. That's a, a risk that she always, it, either a good thing or a bad thing that she always faces, a possibility. Okay, uh, we have one more. By the way, uh, Bob, yeah, I get your point. I didn't say that my support for gay rights is because of the sacred band of thieves. What I said is that would be my reply to people who use a lot of evolutionary psychology to talk about, uh, how do they call it, evolutionary advantages or disadvantages. Okay, here's what's going to happen. One more qu one quick follow-up by Francesco. Then we have a super chat that is as off topic as it could be, but it's super chat. We need the money. That's the world we live in. That's capitalism. So I know I said this because it's going to be so frazzy. And then we are done. Francesco. You are unmuted. Me? Okay, fine. Um, I listened to what James said, uh, and I was slightly horrified because it talks about humans, human being it's what it means to be human, eh? as if only the members of the Jewish Christian civilization were humans. This is horrible. Uh, it's not that uh, if you're not Jewish Christian, you're not human. If you uh, have um, ethnology, anthropology, you go around and visit lots of different tribes, they have totally different values. I remember reading about the American Indians before Europeans arrived, and they didn't have all this fixation with male and female. There were guys who liked to be dressed as, as female, and still they were valiant warriors, and they went out, uh, were out battling, although they were dressed as women. And then if you go to the tribe and you talk about the loyalty, the family, our nuclear family, in the tropical islands, people started to have sex since when they were just out of puberty. And they went on having sex basically with everybody all the time because and they didn't have the concept that you, by having sex, you got pregnant. So they thought it was a gift from the ancestral chief. And that was coming there to uh, put the fetus into the, the woman. So they, they didn't have any worry. Even husbands would go for a trip of years and come back and find the, the, the wife had given birth and was very happy. And they didn't think, oh, she has betrayed me. No, it's, it's, our ancestral chief has come and given me this gift of a baby. So these ideas that we have only our nuclear family is human and only our, the, our attitudes are human. They are not in different civilizations. They have totally different behaviors. I think my point was just the opposite, that yeah, pe people do vary uh, uh, on a what, much wider scale of behavior than other animals because humans do have choice. That, that was my point, not that humans, that there is a, you know, 
only Jew, Jews and Christians can be human, quite the opposite. I mean, uh, they're all, everyone is who's human is human. Where did you get that connection? What I was saying that humans have a conceptual capacity actually gives them a much broader <laughs> range of possibilities and choices than any other animal possess. And so I, that's, that was my point, not the opposite, that there was some kind of, that the J Jewish Christian model of a nuclear family is the only way to go. I do not believe that. Yeah, Francesco's point on uh, anthropology is valid that it gives us this diversity of experiences, but I don't think uh, that James indeed oh. said something like that. Let, let's, uh, let's correct one thing. There's no variety about patriarchy. There has never been a matriarchal society in all of history, despite all the propaganda to advocate that. And there couldn't be by the biological nature of the difference between men and women. So it, let's, let's draw limits on the variation. I think they're all very much the same, by the way. All tribal cultures are very much the same because they don't have the conceptual understanding that gives freedom. Let's well, not I, enter this discussion. Just for the record, Harry, and I'm sure Francesco will want to say this, uh, most of, many, many anthropologists would passionately disagree with that. But Yeah, I was just about to qualify it myself. Uh, we know of certain societies that, that have some matriarchal qualities to them. Oh, yeah, yeah. some so matriarchal. But they're for example, inheritance is from mother to daughter, uh, but women are the polygamous ones. Uh, there are societies like that. They don't rule. Okay, so uh, here's what super chat privilege means. So here's the last question. Dr. Binswager, can you comment briefly on we can you comment briefly on Rand's theory of universals and your association to it? Yeah. Our friend recognizes it's off topic, but again, super chat but, privilege. But, I, but it's good and I learned from it. I mean, what, what is the exact well, question? Well, pe people are aware that, for example, uh, Dr. Gotthelf and Dr. Peikoff directly inspired Rand to write the introduction to objectivist epistemology. Did you play some role in the actual history of the way I ran? Oh, yeah, a little tiny role. Um, there was, uh, I was in the uh, workshops on objectivist epistemology and I'm going to be discussing that this Sunday on, on Meeting of the Minds on HBL. And um, first of all, I made certain mistakes that were really helpful in clarifying what the objectivist theory was. I was not one of the ones who requested, you know, she says by popular demand, she wrote the this, this series. She already had the theory, but she put it down in writing by popular demand. That was Alan Gotthelf and Leonard Peikoff. I was Alan's roommate, but I was not as close to Ayn Rand as he was at that time. Uh, the other was there was a statement whose grammar is unclear. And later on, uh, when she came out with one of the, I guess the mentor edition, um, I persuaded her to change the grammar of the statement, not to my satisfaction, but I think it was an improvement. It was an ambiguous, it was a very technical statement and it had a lot of pronouns in it, it's and their, and um, so I persuaded her to do that. I think my contribution is more in teaching it, in explaining it, assuming I'm right. Yeah, I presented my book, How We Know. I think the best presentation of what the theory actually is, what measurement emission actually is. But no, I had virtually no role in inspiring or uh, uh, input to the theory itself. No, that was way before my time before I was born probably, that she came <laughs> up with it. She said she came up with it in the 40s. I was born in the 40s. <laughs> right. So uh, all the comments, I just had a very brief chat on the YouTube. So suffice to say, this was the most heated discussion in the comments that I've seen. Uh, so some people say, you know, the don't try to cancel Harry. I don't think people in the comments tried to cancel Harry. They just expressed their moral evaluation of his moral evaluation. So I think that's just a discussion and it's not, uh, it's not canceling anyone. 
Oh, one more super chat. I didn't make any moral evaluations. I didn't make a single moral evaluation. That's why I said I'll have to listen to this again, because there are many things that I've, uh, I, I didn't. Uh, and, and again, these are difficult issues, so no more evaluation. OK, so last super chat. How we know is the most important text since introduction to objectivist epistemology. Thank you so much, Dr. Binswager. It's been so helpful to me. Yeah, it, as I said in another, uh, in another session, it's for me it would be the equivalent of a maybe not the black belt, definitely the brown belt in objectivism. It's, it's, and oh, here's the book because of the green screen. <laughs> yeah, you have the to hold screen, it in front yeah. of you. Yeah. It's, no, uh, I want to echo that. We all owe Dr. Binswanger a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude. Those of us with reasoning minds. Thank you. Yeah. And Thank just you. to sum up, just to sum up, because when uh, when we when we decided to have this discussion, there were three main questions that we wanted to answer, and that's that's why we had our experts. Although the discussion later uh, uh, deviated. So the questions was what was actually. Uh, Ayn Rand's view of homosexuality. What do these view, where do these views fit into the philosophical system of objectivism? I think the second is the question that most people agree, and it is that they don't. Was Ayn Rand wrong in holding these views? And I think there was a mixture of views on that. So there you have it. That was the wrapping up of uh, this discussion. Again, I say this every time. I know some objectivists get pissed off because we don't need to qualify ourselves. But all these people who say that objectivism is this cult or church or whatever, what I see in our meetups is we spend way more than 50% of the time disagreeing on these issues. So if we're a cult, we're doing the whole cult thing really wrong. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> to go back to cult school. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> right. Well, so Ayn Rand didn't know what she was doing in trying to start a cult. She's told everyone to think for themselves to, to begin with and to be selfish. So, you know, we have problems from the start. <laughs> right. So, Razi, since you are the man behind all this, you deserve the last words and the last, uh, yeah, the last word actually for 2020 for our events. Uh, well, the last word will be tomorrow on the Daily Objective. But yeah, uh, Dr. Binswanger, yeah, the green screen, uh, it, it was difficult to see. So I don't know if you, yeah. Yeah. So the light is kind of, this is how we know you can find it online. And uh, yeah, I second the, uh, the comment in the super chat. Uh, I think every event we do is, <clears throat> is highly controversial to, you know, uh, the mainstream. Uh, and I'm glad we can do events that are controversial among objectivists as well, and that we can have these discussions. I know every time we do, Nikos is going to make the point about uh, if people call objectivism a cult, and here is proof that it isn't. And I'm one of the people who object to that kind of comment. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Nikos, it's Nikos, proving it, proving it thereby. Right. <laughs> Nikos, uh, Nikos also. Uh, a massive thank you to you because, yeah, Nikos is actually a lecturer at a university and talking about things like this is, uh, you know, is, is risky, but um, he does it anyway. And uh, if he's not canceled after tonight's event, then let's wait and see what happens after we just <laughs> line ran wrong about a, a woman president. Uh, massive thank you also to Dr. Binswanger, to James Valiant and to our audience. Uh, if you want to support our work, of course, you can become a member and um, you will, uh, besides, besides supporting events like this, you will uh, have access to our discussion groups Saturdays on, on Dr. Leonard Peikoff run by Nikos and with James Valiant uh, present and uh, helping us understand the material. And Fridays we have our discussions of Rand's fiction uh, and we usually are joined by Shoshana Milgram for that. So uh, all that is available to members. Thank you, everybody, once again. We're going off of uh, YouTube, but the um, Zoom chat will continue. Thanks, everyone. All the best. Thank you.